And no amount of attention or love from others can make up from the hole in your heart that's from a lack of love from yourself. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is on the path to happiness and fulfillment through personal sovereignty. So how to take back your power from what's holding you back in life, how to move through your fears, emotions, and challenges with resilience. Ultimately, it's about cultivating more personal power and inner peace. Our guest today is Dr. Emma Seppala. Dr. Emma Seppala is a psychologist, author, and researcher specializing in well-being, resilience, happiness, and mindfulness. She serves as the science director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford University, where she conducts research and teaches courses on these topics. Seppala's work focuses on understanding the science behind human flourishing and how individuals can cultivate greater well-being. Hello, Emma. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, How do you feel today? Thank you for having me. Okay, so why don't you start talking about your background? I mean, how does one study happiness and well-being? What does that even mean? I grew up in Paris, France, which, you know, sounds really glamorous, but um, there's a a sense always that everything's going to hell in a handbasket. Like people bond over complaining, nothing's ever good enough. And so you kind of, as a child, grow up thinking in a more negative way about life. And then I moved to the U.S. for college and I realized, wow, people are really positive here and there's like (laughs) no patience for complaints and stuff like that. And I thought, I like this better. But then after a couple of years here, four years in college, I realized, wow, people identify with their work and they believe they are what they do and they work themselves into the ground and they suffer. So I thought, gosh, that's, you know, that's really problematic. And then I lived in China for two years after college and this was late nineties. And I just saw people who had nothing, but were grateful for everything. And there was this resilience and this gratitude um, that was so powerful. And um, I then saw that also in Tibet and I saw it in India and I just realized, wow, there is, you know, you can have all the wealth in the world and be so poor on the inside, right? You can have the the, the material sovereignty, right? You have the, the money, the power, the freedom, whatever, but you have no inner sovereignty. And then you can have nothing like what I saw in China, what I saw in, in Tibet and India, and yet have so much inner sovereignty. And I realized, wow, happiness is a state of mind and it's something we can cultivate. And I want to know more about that. So I did a master's in East Asian studies, really looking at the philosophies and the religions behind East Asian, South Asian traditions and got really interested in that and and, uh, topics like meditation and the wisdom that comes from those traditions. And then I decided to do a, a PhD in psychology and really think about how can we apply some of this wisdom, some of this technology in a psychological context to see if we can make people happier, if we can make them feel more connected, if we can help them with trauma, with anxiety, with mental health. And so um, that's been my journey. And so I, I did a PhD in psychology at Stanford and also um, started teaching meditation at that time too, because I just saw so many really talented people around me who were suffering. And um, that was the beginning. That's how it all started. And then I, you know, I started writing too, because I thought, gosh, people need to know about the science. So that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, I I am sure that's a very short nutshell, because that's quite a journey and a lot of studies on this topic. So I guess what were the biggest key lessons that you've learned about happiness, resilience, and well-being in your research, like things that you wish everyone knew? Yes, I can tell you what I wish everyone knew. So in psychology, we think of happiness in two ways. There's hedonic happiness and eudaimonic. And hedonic happiness is basically sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Like it's all the things that give you a material pleasure. It could be money, power, fame, you know, food. And it's kind of self-centered, right? It's about like me and my little dopamine hit, you know? That's really what it is. And that dopamine hit doesn't last, right? You, you, you eat a piece of chocolate or you get a fat check and then you're happy for a moment and then you come crashing back down and you want more. Mm-hmm. And I think that most, you know, marketing agents out there in the world that are trying to sell us stuff are really trying to sell us this, this idea of hedonic happiness. And yet it's, it's a never ending treadmill because you'll never actually reach the fulfillment you're looking for. You'll get little pieces of joy here and there, little pieces of pleasure, right? 
So then there's eudaimonic happiness. And eudaimonic happiness is the happiness you get from something beyond yourself, from helping others, from connecting with um, people ar- around you in a positive way, uh, being of service, from connecting with nature, connecting with a greater purpose, like maybe you're working towards alleviating animal suffering on the planet or whatever it is, right? That form of happiness is a form of happiness that doesn't just give you a dopamine hit and then a drop. It actually lasts. And it's what I would say leads to more than happiness, but to fulfillment. And when Mm -hmm. you look at it from a scientific perspective, people who engage in more eudaimonic activities, they actually have less inflammation at the cellular level. They live longer lives. They're healthier not just happier. And I think that's one of the best kept secrets because there's no marketing agents out there telling you, hey, go out and do some community service. Nope, nobody's going to make money off of you connecting, you know, hugging a tree, right? But there's a lot of money to be made on trying to get people little highs. And that's fine. But I just wish more people knew that if you really want to be happy, then what you need is actually free. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. It's so simple, but it's, I think it's something people hear, but they don't understand the depths of it. Like the point where you say people are actually healthier and live longer when they, you know, do those, like have have that deeper level of happiness, not just the hedonistic dopamine, like cheap happiness. Yeah, absolutely. And actually people who um, prioritize hedonic happiness in their life have inflammation levels as high as people going through very stressful life experiences like war. If you think about it, it, it's really crazy. Why why is that? Why why do you think so? Perhaps it because those lifestyles are not as healthy generally, if you're partying a lot or, and the other thing is you're on this treadmill, right? Even if let's say you're someone who's just gets off on getting a lot of social media likes, right? And then it's a treadmill and it's a constant chase. It's actually a stressor. Mm. It's actually stress. Whereas when you're doing something for others, like like let's say you're you're you know you're you're putting out content to help other people with their their mental health, their well being, then you're not thinking about yourself. You're not in this mad chase uh, for you know for survival for yourself. You're in it for others. Your nervous system relaxes, and I think we have all been there where maybe we weren't having a great day, but all of a sudden a friend calls us and is like, "Hey, I'm having an emergency. I need to go to the emergency room," or something like that and you just go all out and you go help them and you're there for them, you feel great. You feel amazing. You feel uplifted. You know, this, the, the quote unquote helper's high, which I think is a, too simplistic of a word for it because it's more than that. It's, it's when it becomes a way of living, it really expands your, not just your mental health, but your, again, your sense of fulfillment, of joy, of purpose and meaning. Yeah, definitely. All right, time for a short break. The show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Can you believe how fast this year is flying by? As we hit the midway point of 2024, take a moment to celebrate your wins and reflect on what you still want to accomplish. Whether you're building on successes or redirecting your path, therapy can help assess your progress and set realistic goals for the coming months. Through sessions with a BetterHelp therapist, I've gained a fresh perspective on my own thoughts and beliefs, which has been transformative. This process has helped me address and heal from past wounds that I've been carrying, allowing me to move forward with more peace. If you're considering therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. And you can always switch therapists at any time with no additional charge. Take a moment. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash TLL. Aside from that big point, was there anything else surprising that you learned in your years of research? Yes. So I'll start with a personal story. I, um, after returning from China and just as I was doing my master's in East Asian studies, I was in Manhattan in New York city. I was, um, attending Columbia at the time and 9-11 happened and I saw the second plane crash. And after that day, every morning before leaving my apartment, my whole body would shake with anxiety. And I tried so many things. I, I didn't want to go the medicine route. But I, you know, I was going to Bikram yoga, you know, hot yoga, like four or five times a week. And, you know, my skin was glowing, but I was still anxious. I was, I tried mindfulness meditation, but when you have really high anxiety, sitting down to try and meditate can be really hard. It's not a great first step because you just become super aware that you're anxious. Yeah. And it wasn't until I walked into a breathing class um, called Sky Breath Meditation offered by this nonprofit called Art of Living that 
I was able to regain my ability to to sleep, to function, to, to my inner sovereignty. I was able to regain it through just through breathing, and that was really a personally very very transformative for me. And then I went on to grad school, and ten years later, I'm working with veterans with trauma, veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan with trauma. And many of them were cases where traditional treatments hadn't worked for them, therapy, pharmaceuticals hadn't worked, and a lot of them were self-medicating with alcohol and, and recreational drugs just to try and make it through. And I thought, well, you know, breathing can work for me, maybe it'll work for them. And so we ran a study that was actually documented in a documentary called uh, Free the Mind, in which we had the veterans go through this breathing protocol mm-hmm. called Sky Breath Meditation. And then a, a group of them did not. That was the control group. And what we found was that after one week, their anxiety normalized and it was still normal a, a month and a year later as compared to the control group. And so that was really, you know, from a scientific perspective, you don't expect something to have those long lasting effects. And that was really also the most meaningful study I've ever run. We did do a follow up wow. to it, comparing it to the gold standard therapy. And again, the breathing was either equivalent to or superior to that. What's gold standard therapy again? The gold standard therapy for post-traumatic stress is called cognitive processing therapy. So I would say, you know, that's surprising. Uh, There hasn't been a lot of research on breathing for serious mental health issues. You know, now there are more and more people who are talking about breathing, you know, becoming master breathwork instructors or whatever. And, And I would say there's many different breathing techniques. So I can't vouch for all of the ones that are out there, but definitely for the sky breath meditation technique is really powerful. Yeah, no, I can totally vouch for, like I've tried a few different breathwork experiences and courses, and it's amazing how much you can do with your body, how much you can heal just by your breath. And it's completely free. And I, yes. like, I'm glad more people are learning about this, but I, I still think it is a very new area. And I recently saw, um, you know, James Nestor, he wrote the book, Breath. Mm-hmm. So I, I saw yes. him speak recently, which is why this is fresh on my mind, right? Like our our breathing is just such a big part of our health and healing. But I, I'm curious if you can give us some like, like what is sky breathing and why do you think it worked? It's a protocol that takes a couple of days to learn. So you should learn it from a trained instructor. Um, again, through a nonprofit called Art of Living. But if you're a veteran or military, there's a nonprofit called Project Welcome Home Troops that teaches it at no charge, which is really nice. Um, But what I would say is, um, what I can do is like teach a short breathing practice now, if you want that, you know, you could do it in a few minutes. Okay, sure. Why not? So um, when you inhale, your heart rate increases. And when you exhale, it slows down. So if we do an exercise right now for like two minutes, I can show you how to Tap into your parasympathetic nervous system and calm your nervous system down in just a few, just a few minutes. Do you want to do that? Sure. Okay. So if we were to close our eyes, we can just, and have our hands, palms facing up, and just notice how you feel right now, and then you'll notice again how you feel after after the two minutes. And then breathing through the nose, breathe in for a count of one, two, three, four, hold, and breathe out two, three, four five, six, seven, eight, breathe in, two, three, four, hold, and breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, breathe in, two, three, four, hold, and breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Breathe in, long deep breath in, hold at the top, and breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, a couple more times, deep breath in, two, three, four, hold, and breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and breathe in, two, three, four, hold, and breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then just notice, come back to normal breath and notice how you feel. And then when you notice any changes, and when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Mm. What do you notice? Mm, I just notice like breathing deeper just calms my body more. Like my belly expands a lot more. I think once you tell me to breathe, then I'm like, oh, I notice my breathing. Because normally you don't notice your breathing. 
Yeah. I get what you're saying. Like it, this slow breathing, like activates the, the calm, the calming effect on your body. That's right. And we actually ran a study at Yale with undergraduates here. And, um, you know, over the course of a semester, they usually, their mental health declines, their burnout increases. And we wanted to see, can we somehow prevent that? And so we randomly assigned students to either the sky breath meditation class where they learn the whole longer sky breathing protocol right. or a mindfulness-based stress reduction group learning mindfulness meditation or an emotional intelligence group that learned just cognitive skills of like reframing and a control group. And we wanted to see which group would do best. And by the end of the semester, the one that had the best results by far was the breathing group. And we think it's because we're not just addressing the mind, you know, change your mind, change your life kind of thing. We're also I'm not just becoming aware of the mind, like mindfulness, but we're also going right in the physiology mm-hmm. and conditioning the nervous system for greater calm. So, yep. you know, exercises like the one we just did, I think are really good for in the moment, like you're transitioning from work to home or before a big meeting or after a stressful moment. But then the sky breath meditation is ideal for kind of conditioning your nervous system, like you condition your muscles in the gym so that you're stronger in life, conditioning your nervous system so you have more stress resilience. And that's what right. my colleague at Harvard found that after doing the sky breath meditation, when they placed participants into a stressful situation, they responded with less of a stress or stress response. It's something you do when you're feeling stressed, or is it just something that you continue doing every day to ma- be able to manage that stress? It's something you do to condition your nervous system so you have less of a stress response in the first place. Mm. So you're calmer, see? Right, right. Yeah, that's how I think of it. Just like you go to the gym to condition your muscles so you're stronger. Yeah. No, I love it. And I also agree with how I think a lot of times Western psychology or mental health is just about the mind and they forget about bringing it down to the body because it's so much of right? everything, hap- like the mind body is the same, right? But we're just focusing on up here by talking. Yes. And that's been so frustrating to me. And I think it's because academics, and I'm surrounded by academics because I've only been at universities, are so like disembodied. They're in their head. And so I, that's one of my theories as to why psychology is so in the head. But even working with like veterans or with children, you see they're not in their head. And they're kind of like, uh, can we please do something like, you know, more embodied? And, you know, the veterans in particular, they have this show me attitude. They're like, okay, what's this hippie dippy stuff? Like they came to our study just being like, we're just here to get paid. And I was like, that's <laughs> great. Like, I love that attitude, you know, yeah. just have a show me attitude. Yeah. And the moment they started breathing, they're like, okay, we get it. Because mm. they can immediately see the results as opposed to some of these other techniques just in the head. Yeah. If you got anxiety in your body, it's like there was one veteran, he, he was like, I'm standing in front of the mall in Wisconsin. I know there's no danger in the mall, but I have to brace myself for 20 minutes before I can walk in. There's nothing wrong with his mind. But the trauma is locked in his body. And so being able to do the breathing could unlock that, release that. So then he can go on, go into the mall without having to brace himself for 20 minutes. Yeah, I think that's something that hopefully more people in the academic world (laughs) can understand. Because I've like studied like holistic Eastern healing and a lot of it is like body work. And so I think there's, you know, there's so many compartments to healing. And I think we're just starting to understand putting it together. Yes, I'm so glad that you're you've been studying that because that's what's been missing is the embodied component of healing. And when we can address that and and make ourselves more whole as opposed to right. right? We already live in a very disembodied age. We're all like on our media, like in a virtual world, far from nature, right? It's true. We're we're living in this like heady, like virtual r- world of social media, everything. But then we forget that earth is right here. It's all around yeah. us. <laughs> Our body is here and nature is here. And yeah, we have to connect sometimes, <laughs> you know? It's so, so true. Yeah. And that's why nature is another, nature's another secret to happiness. You know, research shows that spending time in nature improves anxiety, depression. Um, it, it improves so your, your ability to think clearly, your attention, your memory, your creativity. It even improves your communication skills. It's amazing. And yeah. it's free if you have access. Of course, a lot of people don't have access, but even having a plant on your desk, I have plants you can see here. You know, it has an impact. And if you don't have even a window to have plants, you can have a screensaver or a poster. And that even that makes a, a difference, research shows. That's how connected we are to nature. 
All right, time for another quick break. This episode is proudly brought to you by Lola V, the award-winning hair care line founded by Jennifer Aniston. Introducing Lola V, clean, plant-powered products for every hair type and texture. And a special treat for you, for a limited time, you get an exclusive 15% off your entire order at lolav.com. Just use the code TLL at checkout. I've incorporated Lola V's restorative shampoo, conditioner, and glossing detangler into my hair care routine to protect my hair from damage. I appreciate their natural plant-based ingredients and signature scent, which fuses citrus, rose, lemongrass, and green tea into a spa-like aroma. Check out all Lola V products at your local Ulta Beauty location to experience the luxurious scent for yourself or head directly to their website at lolav.com. As our loyal listeners, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use the code TLL at checkout. That's 15% off your order at lolavie.com with promo code TLL. Please note that you can only use one promo code per order and discounts cannot be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. Your hair will thank you. You were using this term sovereign and sovereignty, and I know your next, your new book is called Sovereign. So why don't we talk about that book? First of all, what is your definition of sovereignty? The quality of our life depends on the state of our mind. And what I mean by that is, like I was sharing earlier, you can be in the best environment. You can have all the riches, all the everything, and still be unhappy on the inside. Or you can have nothing and still be happy, fulfilled, and very authentically connected to who you are on the inside. And I would call that sovereignty. And I've been studying the science of happiness for 15 years. And I saw that you can be doing all the practices, all the well-being practices, but if you're still buying into ways of thinking, behaving, and acting that are not life supportive and that are destructive even, then you'll never actually reach the levels of fulfillment and potential that you want to reach in this life. And that's why I wrote Sovereign. Because in my book, Sovereign, I'm trying to raise awareness of all the ways in which we stand in our own way without realizing it, sometimes totally unconsciously, and how we can become aware of that and turn that around so we can become more sovereign. So let me take an example. You know, whenever I teach audiences, um, and I I do that, you know, I teach leaders at the Yale School of Management. I also just uh, do keynotes speeches and so forth, whenever I ask how many of you are self-critical, 90 to 95% of the people in the room raise their hand. When you look at it from a psychological perspective, self-criticism is self-loathing. Self-awareness is different. Self-awareness is like, oh, okay, I have this weakness. I should try and make up for it or need help with it or, or, or at least know that it's there, right? Self-criticism are the words that people use for themselves whenever they fail or are not up to par. Whenever I've asked audiences, what are the words you say to yourself when you fail or do something embarrassing? They use words that are really heartbreaking to hear, like you're such an idiot, you don't belong, or and worse, much worse. And then it, when I asked them, well, what if your best friend or your child called you and they just made a similar mistake? What would you say to them? And they say things like, you're okay. Everyone makes mistakes. It's no big deal. You've got this. You know, really compassionate words. What's the difference between you and your best friend? There is no difference except that you live in different bodies. So the self-loathing program is one example of how we abdicate our sovereignty without realizing it and without questioning it. Why? Because everyone's doing it. So we think it's normal and it's not normal. Research shows that when you're very self-critical, you are more likely to have anxiety, to have depression, to have fear of failure, to be less likely to want to try again. It's the opposite of resilience. We need people to be resilient. We need everyone to be able to show up their best. And research shows that when when you have a a life supportive relationship with yourself, which means a relationship with yourself as kind and caring as you would have with your best friend, you are have better mental health. You have better physical health. You sleep better. You have better relationships. You have better cognition. You're much more resilient in the face of failure. Basically, you're able to show up as your best self. So that's just one one small example of a way that we can keep ourselves bound without even realizing it and how we can reclaim our sovereignty. And that's that's my goal with the book. And, you know, it's been out for a couple of weeks now and readers have been telling me that just even reading about it and has woken them up to those ways in which 
they're, they've been standing in their own way and reclaiming their sovereignty. So that's my goal with this book. It's beyond the, the science of happiness. It includes that, of course, but it's beyond that into inner freedom. You know, I really want people to show up in their fullest potential because our planet needs that right now. We need everybody showing up at their fullest potential. Yeah, definitely. So that was one example of inner sovereignty. What What is another example? It's like, give us more examples of what you mean by inner freedom. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So another example is in the domain of emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Most people, when you ask them, what do you do with your big, bad, negative emotions? They see suppression. That's kind of the message we receive from society, right? Suppress your emotions. And how does that work out? It doesn't work out. And research even shows when you suppress your emotion, it actually gets stronger. And it actually leads to worse relationship outcomes because we all know what happens when you suppress and then it all comes out as passive aggression or as explosions eventually and or as implosions, you know, stomach aches, headaches, so forth. It's oh, yeah. really, really, really bad for our health. I mean, I was in a lab in graduate school where we looked at the impact of, of suppression and it's it, it's terrible. Tell, tell me a little bit about how they measured that, like someone who suppressed emotions and how it shows up in other ways. Absolutely. Let's say when you, when you feel anger, your heart rate increases, your blood pressure increases, inflammation increases, it's already wearing and tearing on your system. When you suppress anger, when you're like, I'm not angry, no, not me. All those systems get more activated. Your heart rate goes uh, up more, blood pressure goes up more, infl more inflammation. It's basically like you're taking a soda can and shaking it up. It gets so intense, wearing and tearing on your inner system. But not just that, it actually negatively impacts your relationships. Have you ever been around someone where you feel uncomfortable around them and you're not sure why? You kind of just want to back away. I think we've all had that experience, right? Yeah, you feel their energy. <laughs> yeah, and chances are they're suppressing. And our body registers inauthent inauthenticity as threat. You might not understand why in your head, but your heart rate goes up around someone who's being inauthentic. So if I was suppressing anger, your heart rate would go up. You wouldn't know why, but you're not feeling connected to me. Right. And that's why pe research shows that people who tend to suppress more tend to have negative relationship outcomes. So all in all, it's just so bad for our health and for our well-being and for everything that we want. So what's the other option? You know, psychology does have this sort of top-down, you know, heady approach of this idea of reappraisal or reframing, which can work when your emotion is not very strong, right? So you get a parking ticket and you say, okay, well, I'm going to think of it as a donation to the city, you know, or whatever. You sort of talk your way down from that emotion. That's okay. And it works. But when you have a really strong emotion, like big anger, big anxiety, big fear. Have you noticed it's really hard to talk your way out of that? Right. Sometimes you just have to let it come out in some way, right? You have to feel it. Exactly. And if you look at what a child does, a child feels their emotions 100% and then their emotion is gone. Like they're angry for yep. two minutes and then it's gone. Yep. How long can an adult be angry for? The rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Yep. And so really being able to go through the emotion. You can think of emotion as energy and motion. So having sovereign relationship with your emotions is allowing yourself to experience the emotion and go through it and give birth to it in a way. And it's painful to give birth, but once you've given birth, you've delivered it. It's mm -hmm. out, it's gone. So I'm gonna share um, a personal example that I, I share in the book as well. When I was in college, I had an eating disorder whereby whenever I felt bad, I would binge. And this was sort of a cycle I was in. And I felt bad a lot there. I felt depressed a lot. And one day I had a crush on someone and I, I heard this person went to the meditation group. And at the time, meditation was considered really still kind of weird. At the time, there, no, almost nobody meditated. But I thought, gosh, maybe I can meet this person there. So let me go to this meditation group. So I went to this meditation event. The idea was you just had to sort of sit quietly and just look at the ground for an hour. And there was almost mm -hmm. no instruction that I remember. So for a 19 year old, you know, that's, that's asking a lot, <laughs> but yep. I did it. I, I sat through it and I thought I'm never meditating again in my life. And then I left and then, and I thought, okay, that, you know, that was, I feel a little more peaceful, but whatever, I, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> and the next day I was feeling low again and I got into my dorm room and there was a piece of, there was some pizza there, it, gross looking pizza, but I thought, oh, there's an opportunity to binge. Because that's what I did when I felt low. But all of a sudden, I had this light bulb go off in my head. And the light bulb said, Emma, you always cry after you binge. Why don't you cry first? Mm, I had never had that yeah. awareness ever before. But what meditation does is it increases your awareness. 
And so that awareness popped into my little like 19 year old brain, right? And I thought, okay, deal. And I went on the bed and I cried my eyes out. And when I was done crying, I sat up and I didn't want to binge anymore. Mm -hmm. The desire had gone. And that was the last day I ever binged. That was the end of my eating disorder. And what it was, was the awareness created by the meditation allowed me to understand that the emotion had to be felt and that when it was felt, I was no longer slave to an addictive or compulsive behavior. And that's what happens. But we're in a society where we don't want to feel bad ever. And so we'd rather do anything then feel, right? Let me eat. Let me drink. Let me watch a million movies. Let me doom scroll. Let me gamble. Let me shop. Let me overwork. Let me overexercise. Let me do anything so I don't have to feel. And every marketing agent in the world is ready to sell you something to make you, give you that little dopamine high we were talking about earlier. Yep. yep. So you don't have to feel. It's numbing. It's numbing ourselves. And what happens to the emotion is it's still there waiting for you. Only you're more beat up by your drug of choice by the time. Oh my goodness. You're done. Yeah. (laughs) And so from the bottom of my heart, I want people to realize that they can have sovereignty and that it does involve one, awareness, two, courage. Because you need courage to go through your emotion. You need courage to go through pain. Mm -hmm. But the only way out is through. And in other cultures, there's an understanding that pain is part of life. I think in the U.S., there's a sense of just always needing to be happy. It's in the, you know, constitution, right? But in other cultures, East Asian cultures, South Asian cultures, in Germany, like other cultures, there's a sense that there's two sides. You're going to feel the positive emotions and you're going to feel the pain. And they go together. And in fact, you can't really feel one without the other. And the other thing is, even through, and I learned this when I was living in China, there's this expression in Chinese, uh, I'm probably going to mess up the pronunciation, it's like, which means like eating bitterness is good fortune. You know, this idea that, all, you know, sometimes it's through our pain that we have learned the greatest lessons, yep. that our heart has stretched and and garnered more compassion, more ability to be empathic for others' pain. If we didn't feel pain, how would we even be able to show up for others, right? Mm -hmm. That we gain wisdom and perspective. And those are all such beautiful things. So that's one example of how I'm inviting people to gain sovereignty and step out of the cycles of addiction. Oh yeah. That many of us are in, whether, you know, you don't have to be alcoholic to be addicted. Many of us, if we're really honest with ourselves, are addicted to something. Right. I I mean, just when you were listing out the ways we distract ourselves, it's, it's endless. And everyone in this world has some sort of addiction, whether it's social media, whether it's food or whether like, there's too many ways to distract ourselves, but I love this concept of the book. And it's, I wholeheartedly agree with everything you you've been talking about is that it, you have to move through the emotions and through the pain in order to reach that true level of fulfillment and true happiness. It's happiness is not going around all these painful, uncomfortable stuff. It's going through it. <laughs> it's experiencing it. it. It takes courage, like you said. It's courage because it is hard, you know? Yep. And like in the book, I, I give the analogy of like giving birth, you know? So the first time I, I gave birth without meds both times because my mom had done it. And I was like, I'm doing, I didn't, I want, I didn't want to be medicated. I didn't want the child to be medicated. Right. So I'm giving birth. And the first time I'm feeling sorry for myself. I'm cursing like a sailor. I'm regretting my decision. I'm feeling, you know, scared of every incoming contraction, you know, cause it comes and goes and comes and goes and you're just, ah, and it was just like a mess. Right. Anyway, I gave birth finally. And then the second one, child, I, I had done a hypnosis program And it had trained my mind to be in total acceptance of everything. And it had trained me to understand what was going, was delivery was happening, right? It was babies moving through your body and your body is is like coming apart, right? (laughs) But I was in so much acceptance of it that my husband slept next to me the entire time that I was giving birth. My midwife and her assistant went to take a nap because they thought she was giving birth until the next day. Oh. I practically delivered the baby by myself because I was so relaxed. Oh my gosh. Incredible. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, the analogy is you go through it with full acceptance and surrender and you deliver it. And then you're truly free. 
you know, wow. or you can go through it kicking and fighting and trying to shove, you know, whatever distraction in your face to try and stop it. It's not going to work. It's just not going to work. I feel like that was so good. We need to repeat it. Full acceptance and surrender is how you go through it. Because yeah. that that was like an analogy, a metaphor. But I, I was going to ask you, I think a lot of people, everyone struggles with like the fear of pain, the fear of discomfort. Obviously, we numb ourselves and we avoid distractions because we don't, it's hard to do hard things. It's uncomfortable. We don't want to do it. But like you're saying the way through is, is to have that level of acceptance and surrender. It's almost like knowing it's going to be hard, but doing it anyway. Yes. Do you have any other advice on how to move through that fear? Yes. And again, going back to this idea of awareness, and I really do think that having a practice of meditation is so important. And, you know, if you have anxiety, I definitely recommend doing the breathing too, and some kind of meditative practice, because it helps you to be more in that state of awareness and less in the state of freak out, <laughs> freaking out, you know? Yep. So for example, a child, when they have, when they're angry, they're in the anger, they're fully in it and there's no awareness. An adult can be like that too, but an adult has an awareness. There's a part of our brain, there's a neural network dedicated to paying attention on the inside. There's a neural network for awareness, self-awareness. And the more we can meditate and train that neural network, the more it is, it's easier to be in the state of awareness, even when you're in pain. I know what you mean. Yeah. It's like you can, the more you meditate, you can kind of be the observer of your emotions rather than I am this emotion right now. Like I, I, it's something that maybe you need to experience for yourself, but I, I think I understand what you're talking about. Yes. And the more you meditate, the more you're in that space and the more you can observe. I've actually noticed I'm able to deal better with physical pain too, yep. because I can observe it. And I'm like, wow, I know my leg's not being cut off. I know it's just something that you know bumped it or whatever. And can I just go and observe that pain? There's no danger. There's no serious danger. I don't need to have my alarm bells going off. Can I just observe the pain? And the same with emotion. Emotion is not going to kill us. It's, but it is painful. Yeah. Can we just observe the sensation? Can we just observe this with love, you know? Yeah. And Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, he's a, a Vietnamese, was a Vietnamese Buddhist monk. He, he always, you know, talked about hugging your emotion, hugging the, the fear, hugging the pain. And I love that because it ties into that idea of, we're talking about self-loathing, the opposite of self-loathing. Can we embrace not just the feeling, but as you embrace the feeling, you're embracing yourself, right? You're, you're making room for yourself. We give so much attention, awareness, and care to others. Can we turn some of that onto ourselves? We've been deep programmed out of that. Everyone yeah. is so self-critical. But why not, with loving kindness, embrace our own selves? You know, I always think n- no amount of attention or love from others can make up from the hole in your heart. That's from a lack of love from yourself, a lack of friendship yep. from yourself. And actually I'll, I'll share an example here too. You know, I, I teach at Yale university and I have some colleagues who did, who ran a study looking at Yale university's emotions and they, they, you know, what does this elite group of kids, elite group of young adults feel oh they must feel very successful they're like part of the 0.225 percent who get into Yale right guess what emotions they feel the most stress anxiety (laughs) rest and tired exactly and then when you ask them what emotion do you most want to feel guess what it is is it love approve acceptance loved you get that, Eileen, because you're yeah. so perceptive. But it's exactly that. It's like no amount of success that they are burning themselves into the ground trying to attain. Yeah, it does not equal that love that they're looking for. That they're looking for because that love can only actually come from themselves because they are abusing themselves in the process of looking for it. And the, if you're abusing yourself, you will never feel happy no matter how many people love you. Mm-hmm. Eileen, I, I see that in the students, I see it in the faculty, I see it in the staff, I see it in all high achieving environments. And I think, wow, (laughs) you know, 
how do you, you know, for those parents out there, it's like, oh, you want, you want a high achieving kid? You know, I, I don't want to tell you how to make that happen because it's sad, you know, but I do believe you can be, but being sovereign is showing up at your fullest potential, but it's showing up. You're going to show up at your fullest potential when you're on your own side. Right. With love, <laughs> supporting yourself. I'm also a high achieving person growing up. So I totally relate to all of those issues, right? Needing to prove yourself, seeking the love and approval of others. And it's, it, it's through this personal growth journey that I have really learned to just give love back to myself. It was never about the goals. <laughs> it was never about anything external. I love that. And, that, and that's why you can teach that to others. And it's, you know, that's one of the things like I, I wrote my book Sovereign with this idea. I want this for Gen Z because yeah. they need to learn this because the other generations have not figured this out and they're not creating a very nice model for everyone else to follow. Yeah, right. They've passed down this belief system. Yes. They've passed down the traumas. Mm-hmm pass down the traumas. And it's like the buck has to stop here. Because I honestly think like the, where our planet is right now, where our environment is, the wars, everything, that stuff doesn't happen when people don't have trauma. It's true. You know, yep. wars it can't happen if people don't show up to fight them. Mm -hmm. And once our internal battles are, are not, we don't have that internal battle, we're not going to have battles with others. Once you start honoring yourself, you also honor others. And you realize, oh, we're all the same. We're all one people. No, I'm so with you on every single word. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So I think we both get it. And I think our listeners, some of them get it. Some of them might still be struggling with it. I know that, you know, people with this type of trauma, sometimes this trauma is so useful and it helps them become so productive that they're afraid to let it go because they're afraid of what's on the other side, right? Like this belief system, even though it hurts me, it made me successful. And so how can I let go? So what advice do you have for people like that? Well, I had a one, so I was teaching a Yale undergrad course on happiness and the most brilliant student, they're all so smart, right? But the most brilliant student in the class asked me exactly this. He's like, what got me here wasn't taking care of myself. What got me here was burning myself out. Like, what are you saying about me? Like, how, how can I believe you? And I was like, don't believe me. Look at the science. The science shows that when we take better care of ourselves, we show up as more emotionally intelligent, better decision makers with better cognitive faculties of attention, memory, focus. And we are um, uh, altogether much more able to handle the stressors of life. Okay. So, but I showed him the science and I, I, I've got the science already. You know, I, I wrote about it in my first book, The Happiness Track. I, you know, I talk a little bit about it again in Sovereign, my last book, but the science is there. If you're going to be in high stress mode and working in go, go, go mode. Sure. You might not notice the effect when you're 19 or 20, but believe me, you're going to be on the highway to burnout. And that's what we're seeing in all the other generations, people running around with adrenal fatigue, health issues, um, autoimmune issues, mental health issues, because that's what happens when you're constantly in hydro, adrenaline mode. Anyway. So, but I said to him, don't believe me. Don't believe the science, but don't walk by the experiment. I was like, just be skeptical, but do the experiment. Mm. And I said, for this coming week, I want you to take care of yourself in some of the ways we talked about. Meditate and don't overwork, get your sleep, blah, blah, blah. He said, okay, fine. And he did that. And a week later, he came back and he said, Emma, I got my everything done and I got it done faster and I got to listen to the birds every day. Aww. And he went on to become a Gates scholar. Brilliant. Met, graduated summa cum laude, went to Cambridge University, like just beyond, right? And that's what I'm saying. Just because everybody is doing it doesn't mean it's the right way or the only way. You know, it's right. like when I moved from France to the U.S., I was like, oh, I moved to the U.S. I was like, oh, just because everyone's always been, I've always learned to do things in this sort of negative way, the way I did in France, doesn't mean it's the only way or necessarily the right way. Well, I'm asking people in Sovereign to question things, question self-loathing, question needing to be in go, go, go mode all the time in order to be successful, question the stuff. And then make up your own mind. And, and this is what the research shows, you know? And so I'm asking people to question this way of life and to see what happens when they do it differently. I'll give you one example. You know, so what do CEOs across industries and across countries look for in incoming employees? The number one thing they look for is creativity, right? Because if you can't innovate, it doesn't matter how hardworking you are or how honest you are, right? Who cares? You need to innovate to get past the competition. Okay, fine. Creativity. So then... When do people get their best ideas? 
when they're relaxed or bored <laughs> or when meditating. I get my best ideas meditating. <laughs> exactly. And research shows, and so neuroscience research shows that is when we get our best ideas, when our brain is in alpha wave mode, which mm. means it's not highly focused like on a screen or concentrated. And it's not so passed out. You're about to go to sleep. It's in that in-between mode, alpha wave mode, where you are kind of like said, daydreaming, meditating, not for fully focused and research shows that is when we get our aha moments. So think about all those companies, Google's, Facebook's, other big companies that are hiring these, you know, Harvard, Yale grads to work, 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 being this high <laughs> stress, high adrenaline. Really? Is that when you're going to innovate? No. People are more innovative when they've spent three days in nature, when they come back with 50% increased um, creativity, mm. you know, and so taking care of yourself, like you want to come up with better ideas. You want to come up with creative solutions. You want to write a book. You want to write a song. You want to do something cool. Spend more time in a meditative space or, or like you said, taking time off, not being constantly on sweating, desperate for a solution. Yeah. I love this. Thank you. And I, I love that you have the research to back it up <laughs> because I think this yeah. is something that I've been intuitively understanding and trying to explore, but you know, people who are so ingrained in this belief system, it's, it's always a, it's a battle. It's like, Oh, the old way worked. Oh, but let, but it's not going to sustain me so well. Like it's detrimental to my health. So there must be a better way, but I, I love the, the insight that you bring to this. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I like to do is show the science. You know, I have a show me attitude. So I invite people to be skeptical, but at least do the experiment. Try it for yep. yourself. Okay. And then let's talk about resilience. Cause I think that's also a very important factor um, that a lot of people want to be able to have. So what factors make people more resilient and why, why are some people more resilient than others? And let's start with your second question. Why are people more, some more resilient than others? You know, if you were born and raised in a very stable environment where you felt really safe as a child, you may have a stronger nervous system to begin with because you've expected and experienced safety growing up. If you've been through a more difficult experience, either growing up or in your young adulthood, your nervous system may already be a little bit, have a little bit of trauma in it. For example, we know that veterans who go to war and go through a traumatic experience are more likely to develop post-traumatic stress if they've had adverse childhood experiences. So. It's almost like if you've been hit a bunch of times, you know, your nervous system, maybe you need to work harder at resilience, which doesn't mm -hmm. mean you can't become resilient. You can, right. but I would say that, but then there's also individual differences, right? So in, in personality and physiology, some people are just going to be calmer. Other people are going to be a little more agitated. That's just individual differences. So your, your experiences, your individual differences come together here and that's going to determine how hard you have to work at it. But then in terms of working at it, I would say one of the most important things you can do is condition your nervous system. And that's where things like br the breathing, uh, the, the breathing exercises, like the sky breath meditation, meditation, um, but also other things like exercise, spending time in nature, all those things that are physiological, because even spending time in nature is physiological. In my book, Sovereign, I was looking up research on grounding, you know, grounding's um, sort of a popular practice that you read about. It's like, oh, is this scientifically validated? Well, it turns out when you are walking barefoot on the ground, you're reducing inflammation at the cellular level. You're also spending time in nature, presumably. So there's something physiological going on. So those are some ways that you calm your physiology as well, I believe that making sure that you have the right kind of nutrition. So this is one of the things I covered in my book that I love too, is that nobody's marketing this to us, but research shows that the more fruits and vegetables you eat, the better your mental health. Mm -hmm. Who knew? Everybody's <laughs> like, no, take this pill. It's okay. like so simple, a concept, but nobody talks about it. It's insane when you think about it because everybody's like, you know, I, I was just walking by someone playing the radio yesterday, like a FedEx truck or something. And they're advertising some pill for some ailment. And then longer than the advertisement is the, 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 the duration of the side effects. Oh, it's yeah. like longer than the, I'm just like, this is mind blowing to me. Right. But anyway, <laughs> lots of things being shoved at us um, uh, as solutions, but let's, let's start with the basics. These are ways that we take care of our body and mind. And as we take care of our body, it also takes care of our mind. So there's that. And, and then these practices, uh, like I said, the breathing meditation and so forth. Um, and then, other things include, you know, and you've probably heard about this, about, you know, gratitude and cultivating gratitude. Um, it's so easy for our mind to focus on the negative. And yet when we cultivate gratitude, and by that, I just mean 
training ourselves to think about what we're grateful for. You know, it's so easy, for example, to think, oh, I'm having a bad day. I have a headache or I, I got a, you know, a mean email from someone or something, right? But then reminding yourself, wait, 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 I'm safe. I have a roof. I have food. I slept in bed. Sun is shining. I'm doing better than 90% of the planet right now. Like I have nothing to complain about, right? I mean, really reality checking because um, we have it really good. We have it really good. And even if we're going through hard times, we probably have it better than the, often a lot of people on the planet. And always reminding ourselves of that can help shift us out of the negative mindsets. And I think gratitude is an element of wisdom. And in my book, Sovereign, I talk about this need for wisdom. In our society, so much media comes at us, so much junk food media. And why aren't we cognizant? Why aren't we promoting the millennia of wisdom that every human civilization has offered us? We're sitting on a gold mine yep. from every part of the world. And why are we not prioritizing that? Why are we not reading that? Why are we not listening to that? Why are we not engaging with that? Because the junk food media is like junk food for our brain. Like you are what you eat is not just true of your body. It's true of your mind. If you're watching a lot of, if you're just scrolling through Instagram, looking at people, you know, doing makeup or, you know, whatever, you're going to feel like you're not enough and you're not beautiful enough and you're not whatever. Right. But if you're uh, choosing to read or maybe follow people who are offering bits of wisdom that enhance your life, that comes back in your mind later and is like, oh yeah, that was really useful. You're nourishing yourself. So how are we nourishing our minds? Um, and that's something I practice every day. I, there's, um, people that I follow, like I have my, my own teacher, Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. I listen to him on YouTube before I go to bed at night. So I'm just like, I want to go. Last thing I want in my mind is wisdom, is wisdom that helps me become free. That helps me with my inner sovereignty. Yeah. I, I'm the same way. You have to be so intentional about what you consume food wise and media wise. And I, I think just the reason people aren't doing that is just their, the level of awareness, right? When you have, the, you don't have the awareness, you just take what's automatic. You, you, right? The junk food, junk media. And it's easier because it's right in front of you. They're selling it to you. The dopamine fix, like just all of that. But yeah. it takes a deeper level of awareness to search beyond that. And I, I think meditation is a, a beginning way to kind of build that level of awareness. Um, you touched on your lifestyle and routines. I'm curious, what are some habits or practices that you consistently do to keep up this, like just everything, the mindset, the, the happiness lifestyle? Well, I start my days at 5.30 in the morning with two little boys and a cat jumping on me, so, <laughs> which is a nice way to start the day, but it's, it's 5.30. It's quite early. But once they're, you know, once they're settled in school or breakfast or something, I do a little bit of yoga. I do the sky breath meditation. I've been doing it every day for 20 years, ever since 9-11. How long do you do that meditation for, the sky breathing? The bre that is 20 minutes. And then I do another 20 minutes of actual meditation after that. So Okay. That's about 50 minutes right there. And then before I go to bed at one point in the afternoon or in the evening, I do another 20 minute meditation. So that's, that's just always there. Um, and then I also try to go outside every single day, even if it's just a couple walks around the block. I mean, I just to wait, A to move, but B, I need like the sunlight. We know about the research on sunlight, but also nature. I need to look at some trees <laughs> and also be unplugged away from yeah. my computer. I don't take my phone. I'm just out mm -hmm. and just reset. Um, so those are things I do every day. And, um, when I can, I also go to yoga class or do something else. And, you know, I've got little kids and I do work, so I have, but I try to do breaks. I try to listen in. What do I need? You know, if I'm really exhausted, I'm not going to push through. I'm going to sit down, close my eyes for five minutes and just do a mini meditation or, um, uh, listen to what, what I need, because I also know that's how I'm going to be most fueled for what I need to do next. So, and in terms of eating, I eat mostly, you know, I eat vegan, mostly fruits and vegetables and really attentive to the food that I eat because I had some health issues and I realized it's not an option. It's imperative um, to take care of this, to take care of this home. You know, the bodies are only home we have for life. <laughs> so Yeah. No, I, I love to hear it. I always love hearing people's lifestyles and routines because I think we, you know, you can learn this stuff, but how are you living this stuff every day? I think it's really yeah. important, like how we implement it. Okay, Emma, so if you can leave the audience with one final message today, what is that message? 
Yeah. So the quality of your life depends on the state of your mind. You know, it doesn't matter what's happening on the in, on the outside. You have the option of being sovereign on the inside. You know, just like you can be on a beautiful beach in Hawaii and be upset. And it doesn't matter that you're on the beach, you're so upset. Or you could be stuck in traffic and playing music and dancing, being happy regardless of traffic, right? And that's good news because we can't always control what's coming to us from the outside. But what we can do is have a say over our internal state, our inner sovereignty through all the things that we talked about today. So I think that's that's a message of hope. That's a message of, okay, I've got this. And no matter what happens, I can still nurture my inner sovereignty. Does that mean I won't fall? I won't get upset or I won't have periods that are really hard? No, but it means that you'll be able to get up again and keep going and remember the, the, the greater perspective. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And then lastly, where can we find you online? Yes. Um, you can find me. So on Instagram, I'm at the happiness track. I'm on, um, YouTube. I have a website called I am sov.com. I a M S O V.com where I talk more about sovereignty tools and, uh, yeah, I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn and all that. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Definitely check out Emma Seppala. We'll put all the links down below as well as the link to your new book, Sovereign. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. That was so insightful today. Oh, that was so fun, Eileen. I didn't know we were so on the same page about everything. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah.